it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Bill William Samuels, um, whose head founded the uh, Florida Panther Project. And the title of this talk is Florida Panther Back from the Brink. And uh, before we even go any further, I really want to thank uh, Bill and his wife and Karen for uh, working last minute. We sort of had one of those uh, Mercury retrograde astrology glitches in the energy today, but we pulled it all together. So I really want us all to thank them for their hard work at the very last minute. So, uh, so Bill and his wife are, are managing this presentation for us and Bill runs the Panther Project as a non-government organization, as a nonprofit founded in 1993. He moved uh, to Southwest Florida from Virginia in 1985. And as far as I can tell, he's just been working full time uh, to save the Panthers in, in Florida and to educate everybody uh, on what they really are and how all the conflicting interests can um, take care of the Panthers and take care of each other. So uh, we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude for all the work he's been doing for over 27 years. As the Sarasota Herald Tribune says, Bill has immersed himself in the biological and political culture of a creature so rarely glimpsed that it enjoys a near mystical status. And what I want to know, Bill, before the end of tonight's presentation is, have you seen a panther yet in Florida? Please let us know during your talk. Take it away, Bill. Thank you very much for that introduction. This is, this is what's called winging it, I think, in showbiz. We're, we're winging it a little bit here. I would like to ask everybody, thank everybody that's uh, watching and uh, ask them to uh, a little patience with these slides. These are real slides taken a long time ago. Uh, if I have one thing to bring to the table, I'm old. I'm old and I, I grew up uh, uh, learning about these uh, animals and now I'm in Florida, been doing this for 28 years. And uh, I've learned a few things, picked up a few things along the way. I hope these slides are entertaining to everybody. This is not a college level lecture. This is not a uh, fact, uh, uh, too, too heavy on the facts. This is a fun look at 35 years of working with the Panther to take people from back in the 1960s, we were down to probably 25 or 30, maybe three dozen Panthers left in the wild in Florida total. We've come a long way since then and these slides might help people get a little historical perspective on where we were then and where we are today. 1975 or so, when you came to Florida, some of the people that are listening, in fact, I'm sure a lot of the people listening were not here in Florida in 1975. They've come to Florida since then. And what they would see when the drive to Florida back then were places like this. This is, this is just typical roadside uh, before the interstate highway system took a little traffic. You came to Florida and you came past a lot of places like this. To show you how old this slide is, the gas price in the back is 54.9 a gallon. So you know how old that is. Okay, all of these, all these places had a wildlife show or a uh, jungle adventure place. You could go out back and you could see bobcats, peacocks, otters. Occasionally one would have a panther in a cage that you could see. But the back roads of Florida had these places all up and, all up and down the, uh, from North Florida all the way down to South Florida. And they all had animals. The interstate transportation system before it was built, you had to go through places like this. And some of you in this audience, I know you won't admit it, but you remember when air conditioned was a condition, whether you, whether that made a decision on whether you stayed at that motel or not. That's how 
that's how far back these go. That made a difference in your selection of motels. It was air conditioned or not. And the old tourist attractions of Florida that brought us here in the 60s and 70s. This is the old jail up in St. Augustine. There's Silver Springs. That's one of the oldest tourist attractions in Florida up near Ocala. People would come down to see the Florida Keys all the way down to Key West and the state parks along the way. And then of course in 1971, this is a terrible slide, I apologize. Walt Disney World opened. Walt Disney World changed everything in Florida. There's Snow, uh, Snow White's traveling band there and, and uh, uh, Walt Disney World changed everything. Along with Walt Disney World opened up places like SeaWorld and Universal Studios and, and all the rest. Now that girl there on the right, uh, she's been my wife for 45 years. So don't say anything about that picture right there. <laughs> now here's a picture of SeaWorld from 1976. There are some endangered species in this picture. If you look along the back slide there, you see those things are called trees. In Orlando, there aren't many of those left. That's, that's uh, that killer whale there. Uh, those, those shows have all been and changed and SeaWorld has changed their policies and all, but this is 1976. So a lot of people say, well, now that Disney World's here, and all the traffic is coming, millions and millions of visitors. Uh, was that going to be the end of the old Florida as we knew it? Especially as it affected the Florida Panther. This is the Florida Panther. He's sometimes called mountain lion, puma, cougar, catamount. The animal that we call panther in Florida is the same animal in North America called all these different names. He lives all up and down the eastern woodlands. When the settlers first came to this country, he was found all the way from the Atlantic across to the Pacific, all the way from the Arctic Circle down to Central America. It's a North American puma. We call him panther in Florida. He lives in all kinds of different terrains. He adapts to different environments, different habitats. He only comes in this color right here. This is a North American puma. He does not come in black. We'll talk about that some more in a few minutes. This, this is a North American puma called the panther in Florida. This is not a panther, even though the Florida bobcat accounts for about probably 80% of Florida panther sightings. They're not related in any way. The bobcat, um, when it's mature, has spots on it similar to a panther kitten, but they don't have the long tail that the panther has. He's got golden eyes. He can see better at night, six times better than we can at night. He can drink standing up as some cats cannot do. Big wide paws, you can see the paws how helpful that is in South Florida with the marshy terrain and the swampy conditions he has to live in, in South Florida. He's adapted very well to South Florida. That's a mature male Florida panther. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. This, this, is, an, this is an original Kodak slide projector, so sometimes it skips. Okay, there's a mature panther doing what they do a lot in South Florida with the heat 
and the uh, humidity. They spend a lot of time resting up in the daytime. They do most of their hunting and traveling around and looking for mate in the evening hours, early morning hours. Now here come the oohs and ahs slides. This is a Florida panther kitten. You can see the similarity in the spots when they're young with the picture that Bobcat we saw a few minutes ago. They sometimes can be mistaken because they are a little bit similar when they're young, but they have that long tail. We look close here at this next slide. You can see he's got blue eyes. Panther kittens, when they're born, have blue eyes. They have those spots for about two years and their eyes will turn that golden yellow color about the same time. But they are born with blue eyes and the spots are for the same reason that many animals are born with uh, markings when they're young that they lose. It's for camouflage to protect us from its enemies. This little kitten's worst enemy is probably another panther. Male panthers will come around and if they find a den, they're, they're known to kill all the kittens in it. Uh, we're not quite sure why they do that. There's a lot of different theories about it, but he needs that camouflage and his mother will hide him in the palmetto thickets to keep a male panther, an older male panther in the area uh, from killing him. So they do need that camouflage. There's a good picture of his eyes, blue eyes. As mentioned before, they live in all kinds of habitat, all kind of uh, different terrain. They will live in upper, um, higher ground, pine thickets. They live in the marshlands in South Florida. This, this is in Big Cypress. They live in the prairies. They live in uh, semi-rural uh, areas with uh, pasture, semi-improved pasture, rural farmland. They adapt to all of it. Um, and they're actually the most adaptive of all the cats. Uh, they're found, uh, they're spread more worldwide than any other uh, cat because their ability to adapt. They're amazing animals. Now the biggest enemy, of course, is the red and white traffic cone. It means more road construction. Uh, I'm sure some of the questions later, and we'll try and have some question and answer time at the end, will deal with uh, the toll road situation, whether that's gonna affect the Panthers and things like that. But overall, the incredible loss of habitat, which means more roads and more subdivisions and more shopping malls and, and all of that is the number one uh, fear the Panther followers have. That, that's gonna be the ultimate uh, worst enemy uh, in South Florida is a loss of habitat indicated by this uh, slide. And with the new roads, obviously, the roadkill situation is going to be talked about. We lose all kinds of animals, obviously, the otter. Here's an alligator that didn't make it across Highway 29. The state is uh, very sensitive to the, the numbers of roadkill in South Florida. They've done a number of uh, studies. There's there's an active uh, transportation subcommittee, Panther uh, subcommittee meeting on uh, issues involving roadkill. They've done things like lower the speed limits at night when most of the uh, activities when you're traveling around, most of the Panther activities are done at night. So they've slowed, tried to slow traffic down. Put an increased signage uh, in South Florida. So people, at, at least they're alerted to the fact that there are panthers around. Whether it actually affects their slowing down or not is a matter of debate, but 
There's no way people can drive through South Florida not when no winter and panther habitat. You know, the State Department of Transportation takes it very seriously. This picture was taken, this slide was taken back in 1976. And you can see somebody thought it was uh, humorous there. It's, the sign says less than 29 or no, less than 30 panthers remaining. And somebody crossed it out and put 29. Evidently, there have been roadkill there recently. But that's how low the population got at one point back in the 70s. And there was real concern that panthers would even be here in, in the year 2021. They would be extinct. They'd be completely wiped out South Florida. So the federal United States Fish and Wildlife people got together with the Florida Fish and Game people, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, and plans were made up, recovery plans were made up that were involving bringing, that involved bringing uh, cougars from Texas. They brought eight female cougars from Texas, uh, Texas being the closest um, remaining population of panthers, that we call them panthers here, of course, but uh, North American puma that would have uh, actually been breeding, a breeding population, southeastern United States uh, breeding population, the closest remaining were in Texas, and so brought them from Texas to breed with the animals in Florida. They actually put them on the ground and uh, they did what they're supposed to do. They produced kittens. It was a very controversial uh, project, but it worked. The controversy aside, it worked and the population started to rebound. And we've got a situation now is much healthier situation than we had back then. In order to help them with the roadkill situation, another avenue that they tried were, were the um, underpasses, wildlife underpasses and the highways. And they're very successful. They're very costly. Uh, Interstate 75 going across Alligator Alley, the, the estimated cost of like a million dollars per underpass or something like that. But in South Florida, all the secondary roads are looked at for underpasses. A variety of animals use these underpasses too. These are not just strictly for Florida panthers, uh, although they do use it and they use them regularly, as seen here. Other animals use them as well. And it's it's good for the it's good for the overall wildlife. There's one of our bobcats. That alligator must have seen the one that slide a few minutes ago up on top of the road, so he decided to go under the road. Sometimes the water table is affected by these. Uh, sometimes they're underwater and be there, and, and they can't just be built uh, whenever, wherever somebody thinks it might be a good idea for one, because of various factors like the water table and things like that. But they are definitely used by the water. Now this is. Uh, one of the two species of wild turkeys we have in Florida. We have the Osceola and the Eastern wild turkey. They're also used by prey animals, which uh, creates a feeding area for panthers and they know good and well where the prey is, there's gonna be the predators. And that's why cameras catch uh, panthers very frequently using these because they know the prey is there too. And we showed a slide a few minutes ago of a panther with spots on it for camouflage. And that's the same reason many other young uh, animals have spots on them. Now, if you look on the right of that slide, you can see that little fawn there. It doesn't want to come out, but we finally coaxed it to come out and he's showing off his spots there. And that's, he spotted for the same reason the panther spotted. Even though one will grow out of that being a, a prey animal, uh, they both need that camouflage when they're young for the same reason. I've had the great privilege of being able to speak all across the state of Florida. Um, 
hundreds of different uh, venues and meetings and fairs. This is a, a booth we have at the county fair. And uh, I've just really been blessed to meet a lot of very nice people doing this over the years. One of which, Joy, this is Joy. She came to one of our shows in Jacksonville and became a volunteer helping us out. Her daughter is now, this picture is about 26 years old, 25 years old. Her daughter graduated from Florida State University with honors in the uh, wildlife biology department. She's a veterinarian, she's a wildlife veterinarian. And she tells people she got interested in it from working at a booth for the Florida Panther. So you, you can't imagine how gratifying that is uh, to have gotten somebody started that's doing something right now for the wildlife of Florida. We've had shows that came out to see us. We set up in parking lots and, and had people, this is, a, this is a show at a hospital where they brought the kids down, they got a chance to see some animals. We got a chance to talk to them, hand out literature and things like that. And, and, uh, we try and make this as, as fun and entertaining with, without being uh, a lecture format. And this is one of the pictures like that. Obviously, in the old days, we used to could take a panther, a captive panther, a, a rescued panther, if I can use that term, that could not be returned to the wild, we could take them into the schools. Can't do that so much anymore. But you can see the attention of that whole group of children there. I'm talking, but they're all looking at that panther. And uh, we don't do that so much anymore, but there was some uh, worry about using captive animals and things like that. But that panther right there, his name was Janks. Thousands and thousands of school children got to see and learn about some Florida wildlife that they may not have ever had a chance to see before and, and very rarely have a chance to see in the wild. And Jenks was taken care of, well taken care of, and got a, he was an ambassador for the Florida Panther and all those children. We don't do that too much anymore, but uh, a lot of school children in Florida got a chance to see panthers events just like this. And you can see there's there's interested kids right there. Those kids right there are all 30 years old. And a lot of them are, have taken what they learned in our shows. There's a show and you can see Janks right there. That was up in Jacksonville. Can't do that anymore. It's just the things have changed, times have changed. But you can see those kids are listening to what we're telling them. And uh, that was that was Janks's role and he did it very well. That's actually their number one prey right there, white-tailed deer. Some people will say, what's their number one food? What's their favorite food? And I, I, like, I don't use that slide and show them what their favorite food is. That's their favorite food right there. White-tailed deer. White-tailed deer is also one of the factors involved in reintroduction in North Florida. Back in the 1990s, the state and federal people decided to see if reintroduction was possible in some areas of North Florida. And they put some, uh, Tex again, Texas cougars uh, on the ground up there and they did very well actually. And some reintroduction sites, possible reintroduction sites were discussed because of that experiment. But deer hunting is second to religion up in North Florida and a lot of the hunt clubs and sportsman's clubs and all were very concerned about putting a predator back into the environment to take away from the deer herd. Um, very heated, uh, debate went on in the mid-90s, the mid I saw the mid-90s, and the, the state decided to back out. Uh, there, there was such opposition, political opposition, uh, the not-in-my-backyard groups were formed, and 
and the political opposition has uh, more than uh, more than subsided. Public opinion has changed about putting the Panther back into North Florida reintroduction, um, but it has not been broached again since the mid 90s. We're hopeful that the five year review, the Endangered Species Act requires a five year review of all endangered uh, species and the five year review for the Panther is, is long overdue. One of the things we hope will be addressed will be reintroduction in North Florida uh, into these areas that they had determined already could support Panthers. Some animals we have a certain tenderness for, some, some non-native animals like the, these monkeys in the Silver River. Some of you may be familiar with them. The Silver River uh, monkey population has gone up and down and fears about uh, disease and things like that have been going on for a while. And Florida is second only to California in a number of uh, invasive species, non-native species that have taken hold. Of course, we do have uh, our black bear and panther as the large uh, predators. This, this one isn't, obviously, this cub. But living in Florida carries certain risks. Panthers and bears, we believe, belong in environment. This picture from an Englewood a canal way back about 1978. It's difficult to see, but there's a man standing on the left-hand side there in the shade of the tree. He just watched an alligator take a dog out of his yard. That's part of Florida. That's part of living in Florida. There may not be an alligator in that canal tomorrow or next week, but there may not have been one there last week. But they, whenever there's a body of water in Florida, there could be an alligator in it. It's part of living in Florida. And uh, the story behind this alligator, apparently when the trapper, the Fish and Wildlife Commission was called about it and they had to go in there and trap it out. And apparently this alligator had seven or eight dog collars in his stomach uh, when it was uh, clean. So uh, it's, it's part of living in Florida. It's part of, part of the risk we accept when we live here. So what does all this mean to this little guy here? What is his future? We know he came back in the 60s and 70s, pre-Walt Disney World era. His numbers were down uh, very, very low, dangerously low. Uh, any kind of an outbreak of feline leukemia or something like that could have wiped out the population. Uh, so they took a big risk. They brought in some other animals from a different part of the country. They bred, they produced kittens, and now his numbers are really good. His numbers are probably up in, in the hundreds, 200, 300. The problem is loss of habitat. We've got the numbers up in the animals, but we're losing the habitat. Thousands of acres a week in South Florida. And the answer is out there. We don't know what the answer is. Uh, we can't stop people from moving there. We would like to see them reintroduced into North Florida and uh, efforts made to use animals or, or bring animals from South Florida into North Florida. Uh, these are complicated issues. But to, to finish the slides, I want to show you two that highlight the habitat loss situation. Here's a slide of Venice, 1955. You can see to the top of this slide, all that acreage up there. And, and in 1955, it was, it was like that all the way across to the East Coast. All the way across the center part of the state, there were pastures, groves, citrus groves, farmland, uh, semi-improved pasture, um, wilderness land, actually land that uh, had not been developed at all. Panthers and black bears thrive. 25 years later, here's Venice, 25 years later. And this is, this is just a, a, a tip of the iceberg, but it gives you an idea what's happened throughout all of South Florida, 
all of that habitat to the top of this picture, which is looking eastward towards the, towards the east coast, it's all gone, <clears throat> as far as you can see. And we're losing it every single day. That is the problem facing the Florida panther today. They have some uh, neurological uh, disorders that they've been that they've come up with now because of possibly because of overcrowding and there's there's other issues facing them. But the number one issue facing the Florida panther today is the loss of habitat in South Florida. When they're already far above the number uh, the population number that was expected uh, back in the. Uh, 2004, 2005, the fish and wildlife estimates were less than 100 could survive in that kind of habitat. We're way over that now, we're running into uh, interactions with uh, uh, farmers, gentlemen farmers, and small ranches in South Florida with loss of uh, domestic livestock. It, it's not a, an easy problem to address. There are a lot of different people that need to be brought to the table. Uh, I wish it was as easy as just, you know, let's, let's save the Panthers and, and wave a sign. It, it's not that easy. There are a lot of issues involved, a lot of factors, but we have come back from the brink. And our feeling is, you know, we should continue on, we should continue in this uh, path towards the complete recovery of the panther in Florida. So having said that, I hope I've left enough time for some questions and answers. Uh, I'll try and have the questions. If you, uh, I'll try and have the answers if you have the questions. Who's there, Marge? Hi, Bill. Um, can we see you now? Can we switch to... Yes. See yes, you. I can see you now. But can we see you? <laughs> Let me move around here. Yeah, sit in front of the computer now. Yeah, because that would be great, because after all you've said to us, we need to see you. There you, there you are. As I told you, you may not want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. We need to switch to the other view of you or the, the other screen. You're kind of huddled into the screen that we can't see you on. We're seeing a blank screen, Bill. Oh, okay. You see my hand now? Okay, I gotta get over in front of that. I'm gonna mute that one. Oh, all right. I made a mistake. And there, I, there, there. Now he needs to unmute his computer. I muted him by mistake, and only he can unmute. Bill, can you do that, please? Can you go to your computer and unmute? <laughs> oh, my. Can you hear us? <laughs> he can hear us. We just can't hear him. He's getting help. Oh, dear. I need you, Bill, to unmute one of your devices. They're both muted at the moment, and you need to push one of them and unmute yourself. Now we see you, but we can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All you're right. Good. You're good. Are we good? We're good. Yes. Great. Oh, good, good. Now we can do it. So have, um, I'm assuming that you've got some questions there. I'll be happy to try and answer them. Great. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe before we even take any other questions, um, I'm embarrassed to say I don't recall what the program is, but our Governor DeSantis wanting to put those, I'm trying to be polite about it, roads through uh, the, the, the core of Florida up, you know, those, um, I forget what they're called, but it, they're still, I guess, on the drawing board, but how will... If they put roads up to rural central, you know, the central core of Florida, how will that affect the Panthers? I'm, I'm going to assume that the question involves the toll roads that are on everybody's yes, mind yeah. right now. Three new, I apologize three new for not knowing the yeah, term. The, 
the northern toll road would go right through several prime reintroduction sites. So even though there's no Panthers being affected up there now, they're not up there. When that road is built, that will be the end of several prime reintroduction sites. That was the purpose of the 1995 experiment that I talked about. They wanted to determine where some of these reintroduction sites could be. And that road cuts right through the heart of several of them. Uh, it's not built yet, but the potential for what it could do to the, a, a reintroduction of these animals uh, would be catastrophic. The one that's in South Florida, one that's being proposed in South Florida down to Port Charlotte, uh, down past Port Charlotte, that goes through existing panther habitat. That's, that's right in the middle of existing panther habitat. So the damage to that is, is incalculable as well. Um, we, we oppose it. I know a number of different environmental organizations do oppose them. Um, and we would, we would say as it relates to the Florida panther, they'd be, they'd be devastating. Wow, that, that was my sense too. So that's why I wanted to leave with that question. Um, Karen, you have a lot of questions that you got before we started, right? Um, yeah, but I think a lot of them were answered. So let's go through the, the questions that are being asked now. I, okay. I saw one mention there about Frank and Ellen Weed. Somebody commented about Frank and Ellen Weed. They were two of the finest people uh, I've ever met in all my work with, with the Panther. They had a compound on Route 29, Highway 29, south of Immokalee. Uh, some of the animals that you used to see in the Tarzan movies and uh, Sea Hunt and some of the animals with uh, Florida animals, they would go to Frank and Ellen Weed and he'd provide them with animals. Uh, he was kind enough to allow uh, my family and I to come through and, and we got to hold kittens, you know, panther kittens that had just been born just a few days earlier. And he, he's just a wonderful man. He helped me get started. Uh, he sent us uh, offers of help whenever we needed any help or any information. Uh, Frank and Ellen Weed were two of the finest people I ever met. Uh, their compound now, unfortunately, is uh, as, as they have passed away, uh, the state has taken over and, and it's no longer there. But that was a that was a, a legendary place. And whoever commented about that a few minutes ago, I really appreciate that. Um. I can start to ask questions from um, question at Q and A. Q and A. Mm -hmm. So Charles Reed wants to know: Can the ESA or other federal statutes be used to block all this crazy development the county commission plans east of seventy-five? That I, is the Sarasota County Commission. Um, I, get, I think uh, Charles may be talking about the Big Hat developments. Those, de those developments east of I-75, especially in Sarasota County, are very important because the Mayaka River Basin is one of the possible south to north dispersal routes for panthers that are in South Florida now. It's hoped that some animals will move north and reintroduce north of Orlando into North Florida on their own. That would be ideal. They would do it naturally. One of the routes that they might do that is up the Mayaka Basin. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, a panther was captured on a, a, a photo a trail camera in Manatee County. That's the first one we've seen up there in a while. Uh, to get to Manatee, he came, probably came through Sarasota and probably came up the Mayaka Basin. That's why that development uh, east of I-75 is so important. That, that is potential dispersal route from panthers moving from south to north. It's a very good question. That's, you know, that, that sprawl eastward, it, it's coming from the other side too. It's coming from the east coast westward. And the possibility of a natural dispersal route from south to north decreases every day. So anybody listening, if you care about wildlife and um, the out of, well, in my opinion, out of control development, please contact your Sarasota County commissioners 
uh, and tell them that you don't like it. <laughs> you know, it, it, we can tilt against windmills. Uh, development is coming. The people are coming to Florida. There's no denying that. There's no stopping that. We just feel like there has to be responsible growth considering all the things that brought us to Florida in the first place. Uh, and that's the, that's the key to it, responsible growth. Thank you. Gina Nichols asks, is the Florida panther a full species or still a subspecies? One of the questions uh, involving the genetic status of the uh, panther is being addressed in this five-year review that we're waiting for. Uh, anybody that goes to our uh, Facebook page will find out uh, information about that five-year review. It's mandated by the Endangered Species Act that these issues are to be addressed every five years. And this is overdue, but one of the questions is, what is the Florida panther? Is it a subspecies? Is it not a subspecies? The latest published information from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is the, the end all of end all for uh, uh, listing of species, says that there are two uh, species of puma, subspecies of puma, North American and South American. That's it. There's no Eastern cougar. There's no uh, Canadian cougar. There's North American and there's South American. Uh, that would end the confusion over, uh, are they a Florida panther? Are they a Texas cougar? Are they the same as the cougars up in the uh, uh, Northwest? Uh, that is one of the questions that we hope will be answered by this five-year review. That's a, that's a very good question. Let's see, somebody else asks, Eileen Naman asks, what is the range needed for the panther? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. What is the range needed for the panther? I presume what like- What, is the, what is the range needed? What is the amount of land are, needed? Are they territorial? I would add to that question too. And that does involve territory. Male panthers will fight to the death over territory. Wow. When there's not enough for uh, uh, separate families, uh, different families, they will fight to the death. There's many people that think that uh, territorial aggression, which is called interspecific aggression, accounts for more deaths than roadkill even. But the animals are not found. They're, they're uh, dragged off into the uh, woods and, and uh, uh, scavenged, and they're not even found. Uh, young panthers are hit on the road many times because they're trying to escape larger dominant males, they're going to kill them. Uh, they're very territorial. They will kill uh, other males in the territory and they do require a lot of territory. Uh, anybody that owns a cat, a house cat, let it out in the yard in the, in, in the evening, let it go out for a while, it goes all over the place. Cats are cats. Are cats and these male cats will travel, uh, it's estimated up to 200 square miles. Uh, it could be considered their, their personal range. Uh, so they do cross paths with each other and they do fight and uh, defend their territory and they'll kill each other frequently over. Um, that's one of the problems with the habitat loss in South Florida. They need territory and we're losing it just as fast as we can lose it. It's just uh, anybody's driven through South Florida and knows what I'm talking about. And every time I go down there, uh, there's a new subdivision, there's a new golf course going in, a new golf course community going in. Uh, we're losing it. It's a losing battle. We have to have a way for them to get north. It's game over, I think. So, so um, let's see, somebody, I think you've already answered this question, but um, I'm going to repeat it again. Conrad Owens wants to know how many Panthers are in Florida now? Well, there's no, the question is about the population and population estimates of animals are always estimates. There's no way to go out and have a census and count each one. They use very complicated uh, data collection systems, uh, trail camera pictures, 
uh, anecdotal information from landowners. Uh, road kill is figured into the equation, uh, but the, the most current evaluation from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service estimates around 200 to 250. Some people say there's a few more than that. Some people may not be that many, but we do know this, they're being compressed all the time into less and less habitat. But those numbers, they, they have to go somewhere and they're being killed on highways. They're being killed by each other. It's, it's, a, it's a bad situation. Have you ever seen a panther? I know I, <laughs> I asked when I interviewed yes. you. I and there are places you can go to to get a chance. If you go down to Fakahatchee Strand State uh, Forest, if you go to the Picayune Strand State Forest, uh, down, if you go down to Naples and go left on Alligator Alley, there are several places there that you, if you spend much time early in the morning, late in the afternoon, you do have a chance to see it. And that's where I've seen several is down in the uh, Picayune Strand State Forest. So if somebody really wants to see a wild, free ranging Florida panther, there are places you can do it. Corkscrew Swamp, Picayune Strand, Bacahatchee, Big Cypress. You, you can see other wildlife there too. That's always a fun trip anyway. But there are places you can go and you do have a chance to see a wild panther. So someone else, Jennifer Sharp Worth and asks, Worth and asks, what happened to Jenks? At what age are most panthers living to be? If, if they're if not Jenks, the, the panther that was in those slides, uh, Jenks, was taken from a drug dealer Back in the 80s, it was very popular, I guess, in the days of Miami Vice and all that glamorous drug scene thing. Drug dealers had big cats. They had leopards. They had panthers. They had uh, snow leopards and everything. Uh, when these animals were taken from them, when they were whatever happened to them, they were, they were confiscated and taken. A lot of them had been declawed. They could not be returned to the wild. And... Uh, Janks actually belong to a place that's still up there, uh, Caddyshack Ranch in Jacksonville, has been home to a lot of animals that have been rescued like that. Uh, they provide a wonderful place up there. Anybody that's up in the Jacksonville area needs to go by and see Caddyshack Ranch. They do a wonderful job, but that's Janks' story. He was actually rescued from a bad situation. Uh, he could not have been returned to the wild. And uh, he went and Thousands of school children in Duval County, in Union County, Nassau County got a chance to see a panther. Uh, Janks lived to be about 16 years old, which is very old for panther. And so we were very happy, very happy and lucky to have a chance to work with Janks. So there is a question. Cynthia uh, Etcher, uh, please tell us about genetic diversity problems with the Florida panther and how that relates to their ability to travel between territories. The genetics are so close. Uh, and there, there was a time when I first started this, uh, working with panthers a long time ago, there were estimated to be 30 different, 32 different subspecies of North American poem uh, that went down to six Melanie Culver from the University of Florida did a lot of research on that. Her work was taken and, uh, uh, and considered Bible uh, by wildlife enthusiasts. There were six subspecies and now this latest says, no, there's not, there's only two. The genetics are so close, all the different parts of North America. And that's part of the information that we're looking for in that five-year review, that's been addressed. We'd like to see the results of all that. That's a very good question. The, the genetic question may be the most important of this five-year review that we're waiting to get. William uh, Mize wants to know, why is there a perception that panthers are black? I bet you a lot of your audience knows the two cats that do come in black, leopards and jaguars. The North American puma does not possess the genetic makeup, doesn't have the DNA uh, that produces melanistic or all black coats. The leopard and the jaguar 
which are true big cats. Our panther is actually not a big cat. Leopards, jaguars, lions, and tigers are the four big cats. Our panther is actually not a big cat. He does not have the uh, chemical makeup to have an all-black phase. Only leopards and, pan and uh, jaguars do. They are of the scientific order panthera. And then <clears throat> the name black panther has been applied to them. The animal we call panther in Florida is not a panthera. It's, it's a question we get asked at every single show and it's, it's very confusing. But the animal that's called a black panther is either a leopard or jaguar and the animal we call panther does not come in black. You hear that every single show, every single show. Lots of people want to know that one. So Mary King wants to know in Canada, or she says, in Canada, they use overpasses and they're beautiful. Could this be an option for many species? I know there are underpasses along, along uh, the various, especially- yeah, the, the question of involving underpasses, Florida's low water table, and our, our geography is so low, there are restrictions on what we can do. We can't go over, we just don't have the terrain to do that. Currently, we have about 66 or 67 underpasses, which is more than any other state. Um, the Department of Transportation is very serious about protecting the wildlife and, and uh, from the roadkill uh, being killed on the highways. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, money going into it, a lot of research, a lot of effort going into trying to maintain uh, these underpasses. Um, as a matter of fact, the Panther Recovery Implementation Team Transportation Subcommittee meets twice a year. It's a open to the public meeting. We try and publicize it on our Facebook page. Uh, people can sit in and see all the effort that's going into it. Uh, but it, it's treated very seriously by a lot of very committed people. Uh, the roadkill problem uh, bothers a, a lot of Floridians, and uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to it, serious attention. So um, I have a question. Um, I, I've, you know, in, in my, I live off of 70 and um, we have a new development called Panther Ridge. And it always amuses me as I drive by because I've been told that there are no Panthers around here. And yet friends uh, who live in my neighborhood um, have seen them on, you know, uh, wild cams or night cams. And um, I, I've been told, and I wonder if this is true or anecdotal, that developers are always saying, no, they don't have any Panthers around. The developers are trying to discourage people and, and saying, no, there are no Panthers around here because if a developer gets wind of the fact that there are Panthers on the property, they have to stop development. Is that, can you clarify that please? Any, any new development that has or potentially has Panthers there, if it's, if it's listed as Panther habitat, uh, has to be reviewed by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. They get a chance to say they can decline to go forward with this or they can uh, accept it and go forward with it. Uh, that's one of the most controversial uh, matters involving the panther. Very, very few projects get, get declined uh, or denied uh, notice from the Army Corps of Engineers or the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. They, it's so hard to say that there's panthers there, they're not there. And uh, that, that's a real deep one. That's a real deep one. Uh, the, the development interests are what they are. And uh, going through the hoops and jump, jumping through the hoops that they have to do, um, sometimes things don't turn out the way we like. And no. it seems increasingly the, in case. Florida, yeah. the developers uh, uh, get that approved stamp put on their so, plans. This is a bit of a stretch question, an extension of this question, but say 
we have a, an area that's threatened like hi-hat development. I, well, I shouldn't, any particular development anywhere, say in Sarasota County, if people find panthers on their wildlife cams, where, where should they even try to, you know, and, you know what, what should they do with that? Because I know we had um, this issue in, right over the Sarasota border here, and we were all frantic to find a panther because we thought we could go to the Manatee County commissioners and say, there's panthers here, you can't develop this area. Well, the, the explosion of trail cameras and motion cameras, uh, there's not a piece of land in Florida, uh, uh, an acre of land in Florida doesn't have a camera on a tree somewhere. They're just not turning up. The pictures are just not turning up. The state uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission has a hotline number that you can call. They'd love to see your videos. They'd love to see your pictures. Uh, they'd love to see, uh, they'd love to get calls. Now, they can't go out and check them all because many of them turn out to be other animals. Bobcats account for a very high number of them, but other animals too, coyotes, deer, dogs, a lot of other animals. So they can't go check them all, but trail cam pictures, uh, anything that they think they can document, a, a kill, a deer kill or something with you know, tracks around or something that they may be able to get some hard evidence, uh, they will come out. And they do have a, if you go to the My FWC website, they Fish have and a, a Commission. Map, an interactive map that you can see where their sightings are. Um, documented sightings, that's important. Documented sightings, uh, that's very interesting to keep track of that. And they, they do want to know, the, the Fish and Wildlife Commission does want to know. It's important to know that the, even though the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has ultimate authority over the panther, the day-to-day -day management of the panther in Florida is left up to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They're the ones that keep these uh, websites and information and, and the data logs going. They're the ones to contact. Great, thank you. So we should all be busy with our wild, our wildlife cams and see what we can do. Uh, just put the link in the chat box as well if you want to go to the MyFWC site. There's there's a lot of places you can report. If you if you think you've seen one and you go to that map and you say you know a couple other people have maybe seen one there or documented one there. That's great. It's very neat to have that information available. That's great. Jean Duby, our president, wants to know, could you alert us, please, when the five-year review comes out? Uh, if they keep track of our Facebook page, the Florida Panther Project, uh, we've, we've been on the Fish and Wildlife Service a lot. Great. It's way overdue. It, it was three years late getting started, and now it was, it was turned in. All the information was turned in in 2017. It's been in Atlanta being reviewed by the higher ups since then. We don't know what's happening to it. Um, that's anybody's guess what's happening to it. If it includes information about reintroduction, uh, if it includes information about uh, preserving wildlife quarters in Florida to get from south to north, we don't know what's happening to all that. Yeah. You know, we don't know what's being redlined. and. And anybody that's dealt with a government agency knows what, what that means. Um, we'd like to see it come out. And if it does come out anytime in our lifetimes, <laughs> we will post it. It's, it's way overdue. And, and uh, so if anybody's interested in following up on that, keep track of our Facebook page. We will let it out as soon as we get it. Great. Thank you. Um, Stuart Pollock wants to know, are there panthers in Georgia or South Carolina? There are sightings in, in all the southeastern states. There are people that will swear to you they were deer hunting last week and they got they saw one going down. We get that every show we go to, every event we go to. Uh, there's no telling what's out there, but they don't turn up as roadkill. That's, that's one thing that the, that the state wildlife agencies always say is if they're there, they would be turning up on roads sooner or later. We don't have any of that. Uh, there's nothing to stop them. Uh, there's one North America or North Dakota cat 
that traveled all the way to Connecticut. It was killed on a highway in Connecticut, but there's, there's no limit as to how far they want to go or how far they can go. So to say that there's none there would be foolish because we don't know. They could get that way. They could get there from South Florida. Uh, we know that some of them have, have tried. We know that one was killed up near Jacksonville that came up to St. John Basin. Um, so there's nothing stopping them. And when somebody tells me this, I, I, I don't know. Many of them turn out to be other animals. I will say that. Many of them do. They're caught on camera somewhere else. And, you know, they, they reveal what kind of animal it was. But to say that they're all impossible, uh, I think that would be just as foolish. I think it's okay. some, of them, some singles could get their males travel looking for love and no telling where they go. <laughs> so Tracy Smith wants to know, will a panther attack a human? Uh, will panthers attack? A human, a human being. In Florida, we're fortunate. We don't have any documented uh, incidents like that. We're all afraid. We're all afraid that the shrinking habitat and putting people and panthers in closer proximity, we, we don't ever want to see anything. We pray every day that there's nobody ever hurt. There has not been, uh, to, to date, any reports, any documented reports. There's uh, old time Floridian, you know, newspapers and stuff uh, have some anecdotal stuff about somebody was chased down the road or something, but as far as documented interactions, bad interactions, attacks on people, we don't have any of that. And having said that, it's still the same animal that out West, there has been some problems. A uh, jogger was killed not too long ago at New Oregon and, and it's the same animal. Uh, they're a little bit bigger and a huskier animal because of their environment. Their terrain is different. Their prey base is a little bit different. They're a little bit stronger and mus more muscular, but it's the same animal. Um, we just we just pray it never happened before. So Charles Reed asks about the neurological issue in Florida panthers. The, the neurological issue, I, I'm assuming he's talking about the feline uh, the that they were limping and walking. Uh, Sarasota County, Collier County, Lee County, they had some bobcats and panthers on video and they could not control their hind legs. Uh, they have 11 documented cases. They've named it. It's called feline leukomyelopathy. Yes. It's a spinal cord, uh, degenerative condition of spinal cord. They have not identified the cause of it. Uh, 100%. It could be a combination of things. Uh, they're, they're looking at it very closely. <clears throat> One of the problems with any kind of spinal cord degenerative condition like that, it's hard to find tissue that hasn't been degraded. If it's a roadkill or, or that it's found dead somewhere, the elements, the sun and the heat uh, cause such uh, tissue loss. They can't use it to, to uh, you know, help uh, determine what it was, uh, make a diagnosis of it. And they're, they're afraid that it's something that's in the environment, whether it's water, uh, whether it, a lot of people thought it was rodenticide, you know, rat poisoning and the way rat poison kills up the food chain. Uh, that's all possible, but those are kind of things they look at first. You know, they try and tick them off first and they have not come up with a cause. It's, it's, uh, which attracted a lot of interest. Uh, the Southwest um, Georgia um, Wildlife uh, Disease Control Center has it. They're working on it all the time. And they want people to, if they see anything like that, see any animals that don't seem to be able to control their hind legs, can't walk properly, falling, they'd like to be notified about it. So if anybody sees that, please call that in to the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Marilyn White wants to know how many litters does a female have a year? How many in a litter and how long do cubs stay with the mother? The, the panther is uh, 
able to reproduce on a regular basis. We've had some female cats produce litters in the spring and <laughs> litters in the, in the winter. Now, when they're that close together, that would indicate that their kittens have been killed. They won't go back into breeding. They won't go back into heat until their, their, their kittens are raised and gone off or they're killed. If they're killed, they can mate again sooner. So it's a good news, bad news thing. If they're having litters that close together, it's probably because their kittens have been killed, either on the highway or another panther has killed them and they come back into breeding cycle. Uh, but they, there are a couple of female panthers with radio collars that they keep track of that uh, seem to get pregnant at every opportunity and have produced a lot of kittens. The problem is that the more that you know, they're in the cycle, something's happened to those kittens that they're probably killed. So it's a good news, bad news thing, but uh, they uh, will have three or four kittens and if they have three one year, they'll probably have three the next. Or if they have two the first year, they'll probably have two after that. But it's usually three or four, three or four kittens. Not all of them survive. Uh, they, they have typical um, problems of any other wild animal. Sometimes the, the youngest one or the smallest one, or the run of the litter uh, will not make it. Occasionally the mother will kill some kittens just like a lot of other animals will do. And if a male, dominant male in the area finds a den to kill all of them, it's, it's not an easy life for a, for a panther kitten in South Florida, that's for sure. Do they know why the male kills the, the, the cubs? There's a lot of different theories about that. It could be to bring the female back into breeding cycle. It could be something uh, in them that wants to protect their prey base, that's competition for food. That's four mouths that are gonna be looking for food that that panther is gonna want for themselves. So there's several different theories There's probably a little truth in all of them. Uh, and they don't do it all the time. It's not like they'll kill every, every kitten they come across, but they will do it for sure. Somebody asked, oh, let's see, Bob Thines asks, uh, does coronavirus seem to affect the panther in any way? I guess they can affect some animals. There, there was some talk about that. There was some uh, research done, and I believe a couple of uh, zoo animals uh, somewhere. I'm not up on this enough to, to uh, quote me on this, but it's my understanding that some zoo animals did have the virus in their system, whether it contributed to their death, whether it affected them at all. I don't know that. But there, that, that is something that's being studied for sure. So how are you doing, Bill? You're, you're doing a great job answering all these questions. You wanna take any more? I think we're pretty much topping out here. Those, those are very good questions. The, the neurological issue, I wanted to bring that up because that's, that's current, the development issues, the loss of habitat, especially in, in coastal counties, the, the coastline is moving in. The, the, the expansion line is moving in all the time. Uh, those are important questions. And the five-year review uh, will answer the genetic questions, the reintroduction questions. Those are all in that document. That's why we're so anxious to see it. Uh, just one maybe sort of off the well interesting kind of question. Gina Nichols asked another question like, with the large snakes, I guess, in the Everglades, like what the pythons, could they, I guess they could get a panther, but I don't know if there's any documentation of that. The, the question is about pythons and a full grown python eats anything that doesn't eat it first. They are, they are bad news. The python problem in the Everglades is bad. They're wiping out in, entire you know colonies of uh, small mammals, uh, fish, uh, amphibians of all types, uh, small mammals like bobcats, otters, muskrats. Uh, they're they're bad. They're really bad. Uh, could they take out a, a panther? Absolutely. 
absolutely positively, if they came across a panther den, they could probably kill all the kittens in it. Our best efforts so far have fallen far short. Uh, they have a panther rodeo down in the Everglades every year. And they offer bounties. And, and if you can't kill enough of them offering people money, there's a lot of them out there. And they're finding out that's that's the case. There's a lot of them out there. They are you said panther the rodeo predators. or a... Or a I'm sorry? You say it's a panther rodeo or it's a python? Python, python rodeo. Oh, I'm, let's I'm have more of those. <laughs> yeah, the, the Python rodeo, they offer people money, bounty, and they, they're just not even making a dent in the population. That's how many there are down there. It's, it's wow. a very serious problem. Very yeah. serious problem, South Florida. I think we'll end there unless anybody to my other... There was an interesting question about black bears. Do panthers react with black bears and which is dominant in the areas that they both inhabit. I didn't quite catch all of that. So the question black was, it, do panthers react with black bears in areas that they are together? Yes, they will live together. Yes, the question, if I'm hearing the question correctly, mm -hmm. do they uh, coexist with each other? Mm -hmm. And they do, absolutely they do. Places in big cypress and everything. A lot of people that move to Florida have no idea that we even have black bears. They just they don't think of black bears and they think about Florida, they think of beaches and, and uh, water skiing or whatever. Um, the largest black bear ever taken in North America for a number of years was taken uh, in the Everglades. We do have black bears and panthers and black bears do live together. Uh, they coexist. I think it's a, a mutual respect uh, situation. Uh, to my knowledge, there's, there's no uh, data to show that they uh, compete and, uh, you know, will scavenge each other and things like that. I, I think it's a mutual uh, respect situation. I also think their prey is different. Black bears eat a lot black of... Bears will, um, black bears will eat anything. Herbivore. They'll eat, They're they'll very eat herbivorous. Dead, an dead animals carry in. They'll eat uh, berries and Right. And, and, all, and all that. And uh, panthers are strictly carnivores. Right. And uh, there was a secondary question, is roadkill a major cause of bear death? And yes, if you go to up to Ocala, that's where they find them on the roads, right? Bears so, die also. Road, roadkill is officially the yeah. number one. Yeah. There's, there's some debate about whether intraspecific aggression is really number one because we don't always see the victims. But uh, with all the record keeping, uh, roadkill is a number one mortality. Jean? I have a question for Bill. First of all, it's a wonderful program, Bill. Thank you very much for doing it, and Connie as well. Um, how, do you, how do you get your funding? Uh, how, how is F the Florida Panther Project funded? Is we're, we're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We have our original goal was to try and uh, raise enough money to preserve some habitat and buy some land. But there's other organizations much better at that, Nature Conservancy. There are a number of organizations that do that. Uh, we have concentrated our efforts the last uh, probably 15 years to education groups just like this. Uh, Plus, I've met so many nice people. I, I can't tell you, traveling across the state of Florida, I hope your listeners uh, can, can see that, that in me. I, I love meeting people and talking to them, and so many people are interested in these things. Uh, we may think, well, all that development is this and that. There are people in there that care about our environment down here, they care about the wildlife. Uh, I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can. We take uh, we sell t-shirts and things like that. And if we go to a, a two-day show, for example, and we have, we have kids' games, interactive games, we give away prizes and stuff like that, and we sell enough t-shirts to keep the little money coming in, that's, that's how we do it. So you have a website, right? And what is the website? We, we're, we're not maintaining the website. We're transferring everybody over to Facebook. Okay. So can we make donations through Facebook? To, Lots of pictures and videos and up-to-date stuff, as much as we can. Do you, can we make donations through your Facebook page? 
you, you through the Facebook page, there's a, there's a link. You can do that. Yes. Okay, great. Great. And I put the link in the chat box if you're interested. So. Okay, great. So I Thank think... You. I Thank you for all the good questions. One of the, one of the most consistent things are the, the good questions. I go all around the state. People are interested in this stuff. They really want to know what's going on. They've, they've read something about like the neurological thing. Somebody saw that in a newspaper and they said, what's going on with that? Uh, good questions. Good questions. And that's what's so cool about Zoom is, you know, we can have people from all over, but they're seeing you and learning about Florida Panthers. Well, I'm, I'm glad I was able to help. Thank you for all that you're doing and have been doing to educate all of us. I know it's something that, that we're just all fascinated with. So I hope you live long and hearty and keep at your wonderful work for all of our sakes. That's very kind of you. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, thank you very for, much. Thank you for all the work you're doing. With it. And one day we'll get a chance to come to the new meeting room up there on, in the Silvery Fields. And yes. Yes, open again. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Bye. All right. So Thanks shall back. I shall I describe who we have coming up next? Yes, that would be great. All righty. So I'm pleased to announce that we have Andrew Crow um, coming to us all the way from New Zealand. And in New Zealand, he's very famous as a naturalist, uh, talking about the birds, the trees, the various uh, islands and all of that in New Zealand. And he's written a book that drew my attention called Pathway of the Birds, the Voyaging Achievements of the Maori and their Polynesian Ancestors. And basically what that's about is the amazing recent discovery that the Polynesian, Polynesia is this enormous expanse of, of um, different islands in the Pacific from Hawaii to New Zealand to Easter Island. And it turns out all of these different Polynesian groups actually consciously move from island group to island group, navigating and going back and forth. It wasn't like they drifted like Kantiki said and they just ended up on Paradise Island. But in, in fact, they, they moved all around, often following the migration of big herds or big groups of birds in the Pacific. So he's gonna focus especially on the role of birds and the importance in the settlement of all the various parts of Polynesia. So if you're into New Zealand or Hawaii or any Tahiti, any of those islands, or the whole big picture, please come. He's gonna to come to us, as I say, all the way from New Zealand where he's very well known. So we're thrilled February. to have you February 24th. Right. Great. Okay. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you then. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Margie. Thanks, Thank you. And uh, register for the upcoming program, everybody. Mm -hmm. Get right onto the website and you'll find the registration button. All right. Thank Get you. Good night.